Thank you once again very much for this opportunity to present part of my PhD work to this important conference. I hope we'll have a fruitful discussion after my presentations and I will welcome maybe comments and suggestions from, from you as well. My name has already been mentioned as Jibril Abbas, a PhD student from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, Ghana, and I currently work as a research scientist at Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, and my area of expertise is in isotope hydrology. I'll be presenting on tracking nitrate sources in groundwater and associated health risk for rural communities in the White Volta River Basin of Ghana using isotopic approach. The outline will be, I'll give a brief introduction, the statement of the problem, the objectives, the methodologies I've adopted, results and discussion, some conclusions, and I have some people to acknowledge, then the publication from this particular work, and I'll spend some two or three slides on my laboratory just to tell you what we do in my laboratory, and then I'll introduce my team that I also work with. By way of introduction, as you all know, water is one of the basic necessities of life. But unfortunately, we still have about 1.1 billion people who do not have access to safe drinking water. Another 2.4 billion people do not have access to sanitation. This has made water quality, quantity, and scarcity a major concern, especially in most sub-Saharan African countries where I come from. So in order to provide this basic resource to this growing population, groundwater is being exploited to bridge this gap. As we all know, the provision of groundwater has increased as a direct impact on public health, food security, high school enrollment. Children no longer have to travel a longer distance to go and search for water before going to school. And then it also comes with a lot of socioeconomic benefits. However, in recent years, this vital resource is facing a lot of challenges. One is high salinity, especially in the coastal areas. Second is fluoride contamination in some part of the country. And third, which is quite recent, is nitrate contamination. Nitrate and fluoride in groundwater has now become a global issue. A lot of studies have been done in Asia, Africa, and in some part of Europe which reported high levels of nitrates and fluoride contamination in groundwater. Now we need to manage this resource, and the sustainable management of this resource is now producing a lot of challenges. Most countries and regional boat blocks have now have legislation to control this pollutant, especially fluoride and nitrate in groundwater. But one major step in controlling this nitrate contamination is to be able to identify the exact source where the nitrate is coming from. This is necessary because, one, it improves the management practices and then the policy or the strategies that you are going to adopt to combat that particular problem. Secondly, too, the action you are going to take will be targeted. You don't need to widen your action. You need to target it so that you can control the problem. And third, we can also make those who are responsible for the pollution to pay for it. In Ghana, where I come from, a lot of studies have been done on groundwater quality issues in almost all the basins that we have. So amount of solid concentration in the water are known, and almost all the basins, water quality studies has been done. But much work is not focused on nitrate contamination. For my study area, the first nitrate levels was reported by Malari 1959, where he compiled nitrates in groundwater in that particular area. And if you could see that he observed a value of around 1.5 as his average. Fast forward two decades later, 
Akiti also did similar work in the same boreholes. But this time, he realized that there were some few boreholes that have registered a higher level of nitrate contamination, up to about 12.2 milligram per liter. This, he attributed it to a wide range of sources, human uh, excreta, chemical fertilizer, uh, indiscriminate disposal of waste. Other studies of nitrate pollution in Ghana also include Karikari's work and then Fianco et al. As I've already said, all these studies do not try to look for the origin of the nitrate. So it makes policy or management options very, very difficult to manage this problem. Now, what is the situation now? As I said, because a lot of studies have been done on groundwater quality issues, we have information on the solid concentration how much of the pollutant is in the water, and then there are temporal variation from so many years it has been known. What is not known now is where the pollutants are coming from. As I already said, this information is good because at least it gives us an idea of the amount of pollutant and its potential it can have on human health. And Currently, too, there is no data on understanding the origin of nitrate and the relationship between the groundwater age and nitrate contamination in the area. I'll try to avoid some big terminologies in isopyrology. Where I cannot avoid, I'll try to explain them. So in this paper, what I try to do is that I try to use both hydrochemistry that has been previously been used coupled with isotope hydrology to be able to add information to the current existing information that we have. So my main objectives are one, to assess the present status and the spatial distribution of nitrate contamination in the area. Then secondly, I also try to identify and distinguish the likely source of nitrate in the area. Thirdly, I also try to find the relationship between tritium and nitrate and fluoride. Tritium is radioactive it decays. Therefore, once you measure the tritium, you will be able to date the groundwater. Then finally, I also try to look at what is the potential implication, especially on health of this nitrate contamination in the area. By way of a description of the area, those who are not very aware, Ghana is in Africa, specifically in West Africa, somewhere around here. And this is, when you zoom West Africa, this is where Ghana is. And within Ghana, I'm working in the Upper East region. You can find it somewhere at the extreme of eastern part of the country. The area is bounded by, in the north, we have Burkina Faso. On the right, we have Republic of Togo. On the south, we have the northern region of Ghana, at the west and then the upper west. It's a semi-arid area. Temperatures, average temperature is around 28 degrees. Precipitation or rainfall, is about 986 annually, and then evapo uh, uh, transpiration is about 250. 2050, sorry. It is drained by these rivers. We have the White Volta, the Red Volta, the Sisi River, and then the Tono River. It has a population of about uh, 1,046,000 people. The population growth is about 1.2%, and agriculture is the most dominant economic activity in the area. So my methodology is I sample about 93 wells from different communities. This comprises of hand dug wells, surface waters, and boreholes. Institute measurement for pH, EC, TDS, alkalinity was done. Cations and anions were analyzed using ion chromatography system. Tritium was analyzed using electrolytic enrichment. The N15 and oxygen 18 of the nitrates by bacteria denitrifier method. Data analysis, I won't spend much time on this because some few results. Now, how is the behavior of these contaminants? Before dissolution of the rocks, this is the fresh granite, and this is the surrounding water. 
before the dissolution of this, you have fluoride of less than 1.5. That is, the water is not contaminated. After dissolution, you end up getting fluoride greater than 1.5. It means that there is what we call natural contaminant entry into the water. When you look at the opposite, which is the nitrate, nitrate before human activity in groundwater, we expect nitrate to be less than 45 milligram per liter. This is by the guidelines established by WHO. After human impact, you end up getting nitrate greater than 45 milligram per liter. Now let's see what happens in my area. This graph here just gives you a spatial distribution of the way the nitrate behavior in the, part, in the, in the study area that I did. The places that show high red values are, sorry, are the places that show high levels of nitrate and then that of the fluoride is shown. Now you observe that from the boreholes, about 14% of the boreholes and about 8% of the hand wells have nitrate values above the guidelines that is being stipulated. For the fluoride too, almost about 7% is high and then for the boreholes and then hand wells about 4%. Now, I tried to further look at the data by considering a value of, uh, you realize that a further assessment of the data revealed that 37 and 5 of the sample, that's about 42 and 20 percent, and 17 percent have nitrate and fluoride values above 20 and 1 milligram per liter. Now, where is the nitrate coming from? As I said, for the uh, uh, for the case of fluoride, studies have been done already that is able to tell us that they say the fluoride in the area is from the granite. So for this purpose of this work, I won't spend much time on the fluoride. I'll spend much time on the nitrate origin. Now, where is the origin, where is the nitrate coming from? So I first start using the hydrochemistry to try to understand where the nitrate is coming from. First, by using some common bivariant relationships. For instance, nitrate, which is a, a contaminant, has been found to be when it moves with certain conservative ions, such as uh, chloride, we are able to tell about its origin. Where the origin between nitrate and chloride are the same, when you plot nitrate against chloride, you expect to get a very good correlation between them. But where the correlation is weak, it means that the sources of these two ions are different. But for the case of my work, you notice that when I plotted nitrate versus chloride, I was getting a very good correlation in both the boreholes, the hand wells, and then the surface water. Now, what does that mean? I also try to zoom down to know where it is coming from by also considering potassium. You know, potassium is, when you use a fertilizer, if nitrate is coming from fertilizer, most fertilizers that we use in our country is the NPK, which is the compound fertilizer. So if I have nitrate and potassium correlating strongly, it means that the nitrate is coming from fertilizer. So I went further to do that plot, but you, you will notice that there was a very weak relationship between the nitrate and then potassium, meaning that we can safely rule out chemical fertilizer as a source of nitrate in the area. Then there's another relation which you call the nitrate over chloride ratio. Can also be used to give you a fair idea of where the nitrate is coming from. When you have nitrate over chloride ratio between the ranges of 0 0.05 to 0 0.02, it means is that the water, the groundwater you are having in the area, there's no much human impact on it. But when you have nitrate over chloride ratio outside this range, it gives you an idea that there's so much impact on the land use change on the groundwater. Now, in my study, I observed that 98.4% and 95%, 64% of the borehole and the hand that and the surface water are from human activities because they have nitrate over chloride ratio above this particular range. In this graph, you notice that I try to use this ratio to understand how they worked. Now, this area has been shown to be the area for agriculture input. This area has also been found to be for domestic effluent, and this is denitrification. Denitrification is one of the processes by which the, the system itself finds a way of converting the nitrate into other forms of nitrate, uh, in the, into each other form, such as the nitrite and then ammonia. Now you observe from here that, just as we saw from the previous testing, agricultural input is not the likely source of nitrate in the area. 
Now, a new uh, this thing has been added, which we call the stable isotope. As I said, for chemistry, chemistry gives us a certain limited information because there are other secondary activities within the groundwater system that is able to change the chemistry of the water. A typical example is what we call the ion exchange. Within, it's a secondary process. Whilst the, if the water is undergoing ion exchange, it's going to change the chemistry of the water. So it's likely the chemistry of the water that you are getting at this time has undergone certain process. So we use the isotope because they are conservative. And then they are also more like it gives you the fingerprint of the water, and they do not change through secondary processes within the water. So people use N15, which is nitrogen 15, to study the origin of nitrates. But later it has been observed that there is some limitation with the nitrogen 15. That is, some of the sources are overlapping. So it becomes very difficult for you to be able to distinguish between them. So there's a combination of what we call the dual isotope approach, where you use the N15 of the nitrate and then the oxygen 18 of the nitrate. Nitrate is NO3. So the oxygen of the nitrate, the oxygen 18 of the NO3, and then the N15 of the nitrate is what we measure. Then you combine them together to be able to find the origin of the nitrate. Now this is a standard plot that is being used to identify the origin. You will notice that this area, when you have your samples plotting this area, it means that the nitrate is coming from press, um, from precipitation or from the atmosphere. Now, when you look at the, the graph very carefully, I don't know if I can just come to you. You observe that just as we have from the chemistry, nitrate from fertilizer is not the likely source of nitrate in the area. Nitrate in my area is mainly coming from manure and then septic waste. That is the main origin of the nitrate. Now, what does this mean in terms of management strategies or how to protect the groundwater from contamination. Here, I also try to find the relationship between the groundwater age, I'm using the word age loosely, against the nitrate and then the fluoride. You remember I said for fluoride, since it's geogenic, the more the water stays within the host rock, the more it dissolves more fluoride and the older that water is. But since nitrate is more like a surface phenomenon or it's a human impact phenomenon, when you see it in the water, it means that it's coming from an anthropogenic source. Now, when you look at the age of the water and then you compare that with the nitrate and the fluoride, you will notice here that in case of the nitrates, and where we have very low tritium, it means that the water is old. Where you have a very high tritium, it means that the water is young. Now you observe here that the young waters, which have very high level of tritium, equally have high levels of nitrates. And then we have another group of waters here that we describe as the mixed water types, which have some, an appreciable amount of nitrates and also appreciable amount of this. Let's look at how the fluoride case is also. Fluoride is more like the rivers, rather the old waters which have relatively low nitrate values are the ones that have high fluoride con uh, concentration. Now, why do we need this groundwater age to be able to give us that particular information? The groundwater age is the time it takes for a new water to join the aquifer. I'm using it loosely. Like the, the time it takes for a fresh water from rain to join the aquifer underground. They would call it relative, that's the residence time. That gives us a fair idea of how long it takes before it gets there. So we we'll notice that young waters have high tritium values and then high nitrate values, whilst old waters have low tritium and high fluoride values. Now that we know where the nitrate is coming from, what is this possible impact of this nitrate on human health in the area? Here, I try to categorize it into two. First, by finding the impact on adults greater than 18 years, and then young children, so that we can be able to put it into context. I use the US EPA guidelines. They gave a formula for calculating. Now, you observe that almost about 44%, 20%, and 9% of adults are at a risk of consuming nitrate-contaminated groundwater. Whilst when you look for the children under 18, the value has shot up from 
40 for groundwater, which I call the borehole here, to about 71, 70, and 18 are the risk when they consume for getting non-carcinogenic natural contamination in the area. This map gives a spatial distribution of how this is being distributed from the area. You will notice that this is for adults and then this one is for children. By way of conclusion, I've studied boreholes, hand dug wells, and surface water in the White Volta River Basin using both chemical and then the isotopic method. I try to also compare both some historical trends of the values, and I've noticed that there is a steady increase of nitrate concentration in the area. Currently, as we speak, we have about 95% of the groundwater and hand dug, water, uh, hand dug wells, which is about 45, and surface water above the baseline nitrate concentration in the area. So about 95% of the, of the borehole and the hand dug wall and 45% of the surface water have nitrate values above the guideline values of 45. The nitrate over chloride ratio has also shown that the groundwater, uh, the origin of nitrates is mainly from anthropogenic activities. The delta oxygen 18, uh, 15 of nitrates and then delta oxygen 18 of nitrate have shown that the nitrate in the area is also originally mainly coming from manure sources. And to just to fast track a little here to show you, you realize that there's a line here which you call the denitrification line. What it means is that there is a process that is going on too in that area that is reducing the nitrate concentration into other forms of nitrate. So in future, we'll be recommending that future studies must also consider the other forms of nitrate. For instance, uh, nitrite, ammonia, and then dissolved oxygen must also be measured, especially because they are redox sensitive. Dissolved oxygen and then nitrate in the area must also be studied. Then we also recommend that in future studies, we try to profile and then study the behavior of this nitrate within the unsaturated zone. We have the surface and then we have the saturated zone. Between the surface and the saturated zone, we have what we call the unsaturated zone. So it could be very good if future studies will consider profiling from the surface up to the saturated zone to see the movement and then the dynamics of this nitrate in the particular area. These are some selected references. And what I've presented has been published in Science of Total Environment. If you're interested, you can, this is the journal that it has been published in. I'll spend some few minutes to give you about my laboratory and then the team that I'm currently working with. As I've previously said, I work as a research scientist at Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. Within the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, we have institutes. And one of the institutes which I belong to is the National Nuclear Research Institute. And when you come below the institutes, we have what we call the centers. I'm affiliated to Nuclear Chemistry and Environmental Research Center. At the center, we have a wide range of research that we do. There is a group that is into water resources. There's another group that is into air quality monitoring. There are others too that are into pesticides analysis. And then we will also have another group that is mainly into organic chemistry uh, research. So some few equipments that we have. We have the AAS, Atomic Absorption Spectrometer, for measuring of heavy metals in soil, water, and other matrices. Then we also have the, the laser machine. The laser machine is used for analyzing stable isotopes in water, especially oxygen-18 and deuterium. Quite recently, too, we have acquired a tritium enrichment line where we can also measure tritium in groundwater. And then we also have an ion chromatography system that helps in measuring ions in water, especially the major cations and the anions in water. Then we also have, this is for, this is a flame photometer used to measure potassium and uh, sodium and potassium in, in, in water. I work with some 
young group of scientists. I hope maybe you can see me where I'm standing, somewhere around here. So this is my team that I work with. This is, oh, sorry, trying to, this is Sami. I think this is uh, Edward. Edward is currently doing his PhD at the University of Saskatchewan. I think he should be finishing this year or early next year, and then he will come back and join us. In short, this is what I have for you. I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I will welcome contribution or questions where I've skipped them, we can have some clarification on it. Thank you very much once again for your kind attention.